Hi, welcome to another one of Dollar Revision Lectures and today in this series we're going to look at the human eye. Now in a subsequent video tomorrow I'll be looking more specifically at the defects encountered but because I find the human eye is a bit comprehensive I've decided to just spend one video going through the different parts and examining the concept of refraction. Now the human eye is an application of the refraction of light and as you can see in this very simple diagram here and we're going to use this diagram to focus on how the refraction would occur. Now you consider an object placed a given distance from the eye and of course a refraction of rays would occur and you would have a real inverted and diminished image formed on your retina. So let's go through the parts of the eye. This shows a cross-section. So the first thing I'm going to consider here is my cornea. So your cornea is the first outermost transparent layer of the eye and you will find that as light rays leave air they will refract through this transparent curved surface. Now the cornea has what we call a refractive index of 1.4 and air has a refractive index of 1. So refractive index is a property of different transparent materials and they give you an idea because there are a number they give you an idea of how much refraction would take place place. So when you have a light ray leaving air and then going and entering to refract through the cornea, you would have the greatest amount of bending which would take place. And that is due to the difference in the refractive indices between air and the cornea. Now as light passes through uh, the cornea, it is bent and it's the greatest extent of refraction that would occur in the eye. It then passes through the aqueous humor which is, uh, you'll see it right here, so they, they labeled it liquid, but it's in fact the aqueous humor. And the aqueous humor basically is a jelly-like layer. It's made mostly water with a few salts dissolved. There is a slight bending there. Now, as the light passes from the aqueous humor, it will have to pass through the pupil of the eye. So as you've noticed here, your pupil is the opening in front of the lens and the size of the opening that is the size of the pupil would depend on the iris now your iris is a muscle which surrounds the pupil it gives the eye its color and as the iris contracts and relax it controls the size of the pupil so if you are in an area of very bright light you do not want too much light entering your eyes because it will damage the cells of your retina. So you will find that your pupil tends to get smaller. But if you are in an area which is pretty dark, you will find that your pupil will dilate to consume as much light as possible to see outside. Uh, you will then find the light refracts through the lens. Now the second largest amount of refraction occurs as it passes through your pupil into your lens. Now always be careful that your light rays um, always pass through the pupil and you don't draw them intersecting the iris. Okay. So as your light rays pass through the convex lens, the second largest amount of bending would take place and you will find that your rays finally converge. Now this area here is called your vit sorry, vitreous humor. And you will find that your vitreous humor is again like your aqueous humor, very fluid like. There is, it looks like jelly, like gel, and it just allows a slight amount of bending. Now, your retina has light sensitive cells, namely rods and cones. Rods allow you to depict black and white, whereas cones allow you to depict different colors. So, you would have your cone cells being the primary colors of red, blue, and green. So, as the light rays overlap with those different basic primary colors you will then be able to you know uh observe or visualize all of the different secondary colors due to that overlapping or that combination now on your retina when you have that real inverted and diminished image being formed it is then 
transmitted to the brain via your optic nerve. So your optic nerve is the main nerve from the back of the eye that carries the image all the way to the brain. Now if it is that the eye is viewing near and far objects, the shape of the lens changes. Now the shape of the lens controls how much the light bends, I told you that, and the power of the lens is inverse to the focal length. That is, the smaller the focal length of the lens, the more powerful it is. Now, typically, we consider the process of accommodation to be where the light, that is, the shape of the lens, is controlled by the distance of the objects. So, if you are viewing a very far object, rays of light enter the eye as parallel rays. So, your lens is thin and long and there is not a lot of refraction that will occur there. However, when you have near objects, you have rays of light emanating from near objects in a very scattered pattern, right? So they tend to be all over the place as you view a nearer object. So what you will find is that your uh, lens will have to be pretty refractive. Right? So the process by which the lens changes shape, and that of course is controlled by your ciliary muscles, as you could see here, the ciliary muscles are on either side of the lens. So when the ciliary muscles control the shape of the lens, making it shorter and fatter or thinner and longer, depending on your viewing, that is the process of accommodation. So please join me tomorrow where I look at defects of the eye.